Often titled the father of comedy, Aristophanes is the oldest surviving comedic playwright. As profound as vulgar, his plays reveal ancient Athenian values, ideology, and controversies. Jeering at and referencing sex, gender, religion, politicians, history, other playwrights, and morality, he is now, perhaps, even more irreverent and funny than ever before. Women at Thesmophoria Festival I see in this play the beginning of a transition in comedy. The jokes in this play are not concerning any existential or political question. The jokes are about mundane folkways and mores. After Aristophanes, in playwrights like Menander, Plautus, or Terence, these will be the ruling content and form of comedy. The difference is so significant that historians often term the first kind of comedy. Old comedy and the subsequent new comedy. Of course, most present-day comedy is of the latter kind, but sometimes you can find old comedy. Unfortunately, a full explanation of these terms and the history of comedy would require too long of a digression. The first joke of this play serves as an example. Euripides, the famous playwright whose surviving plays you may also learn on this channel, speaks with great intellectual haughtiness and his servant humors him sarcastically. This is a typical joke in new comedies, an individual who is oblivious of what others think of him. Skipping ahead, it turns out that the women of Athens are mad at the way Euripides depicts them in his plays. So, he goes to Agathon, another playwright whose plays are now lost, and asks him to go to the women's festival disguised as a woman. This was a festival wherein only women were allowed. Euripides wants to learn what the women are saying about him, and he would like Agathon to even speak in his favor. Jocularly, Agathon is suited for the task because he has no beard, has a feminine figure, and already has the habit of dressing like a woman. A rather lewd joke occurs as the servant derogates Agathon's appearance. My attire has to suit my mood. A playwright has to match his manners to his plays. I hope you'll call me when you're doing satyrs. I'll come and ram you from behind. Of course, Agathon refuses to help Euripides, he says. Keep your problems to yourself. Mishaps must be face and squarely tackled, not wriggled out of. Therefore, Nisilicus, the servant, despite being an old, bearded man, offers his services to Euripides. On ensues a comical sequence wherein the old man is shaved, on all areas, dressed, and so forth. He even practices speaking with a softer voice and walking as a woman would. As you might have imagined, Aristophanes does not pass up the chance to poke a joke at homosexuals. Before departing for the festival, Nisilicus has Euripides swear that if he runs into trouble, he will come save him. The latter swears by the Aether, the home of Zeus, which is a reference to a play by Euripides. As the spy or mole arrives at the festival, so does several women. At some point, Nisilicus prays that his fictitious daughter may find a rich and clueless husband, and that his fictitious son acquires some common sense. Then, before the women begin giving their speeches or remarks, the chorus sings, among many other things, a great defense of womanhood. And all other divinities to castigate. Anyone who in any way plots to undermine the confederacy of women or parleys secretly with Euripides or with the meets to the detriment of women or someone who dares to let it be known that a woman's baby is not her own or a servant who lets his mistress down by giving away to the master her secret lover's name or an aged crone that bribes young men. Curse all such like with malediction and pray that they may come to a sad end. I find commendable that women's struggle would be publicly acknowledged, and it is curious to consider how little has changed in society. The first woman to speak, Micah, immediately speaks ill of Euripides. She explains the following. 
So, of course, men come home from the theater and immediately start casting suspicious eyes at us so thoroughly has this fellow poisoned our men's thoughts. Jocularly, the same woman does validate the men's paranoia as she says. What's more, say a childless woman wants to pretend a certain baby is her own. She can't because our husbands insist on planting themselves right in the offing. And if that were not enough, because of this man our rooms are made impregnable with locks and bolts, and trained Molossian hounds are reared to keep away any lad who's ripe for a bit of fun. The chorus commends the speaker. A wreath seller steps up and claims that Euripides has made people stop believing in the gods, thus, her sails have fallen in half. Following, the servant steps up to give a speech. Disguised as a woman, he argues that they should not be mad for Euripides does not lie about anything. He is, in fact, too generous to women. Lying, he tells the women about how he cheated on his alleged husband. I found curious that the following is mentioned. It so happened that the boy who deflowered me when I was seven came tapping at the back door. I knew exactly what he wanted. No doubt, this is meant to accentuate the defamation of women that Menesilicus unleashes. He continues by saying, What a lovely fuck. Now Euripides doesn't have anything that's slick in a play, has he? I bet he doesn't say anything either about the way we get a goodly humping from the slaves or stable lads if there's no one else to be had. Another curious point is the claim that women often pretend to have a child, meaning they would take a servant's child and make their husbands believe it was their own. I guess this would happen if, despite plenty of attempts, the woman failed to grow pregnant. The women are appalled at these claims. The chorus says, This is quite insufferable. Where was she unearthed, this female? What country gave her birth? The utter nerve she has. Right before our eyes. The despicable old hag. Regaling us with such indecencies. It seems that nothing is impossible. And the ancient saying is proven right. Under every stone, there is a charlatan. Micah sends a comical threat. I and my servants will ourselves apply hot coals to her cunt and singe the grass from the scumbag's pussy. That'll teach her, a woman, to be a little fussy before she ever again slanders womankind. Menesilicus retreats clutching his crotch in protection as he jocularly adds to, or insists on, to what he has already said before. In the middle of the argument, Cleisthenes shows up, apparently effeminately dressed and bubbling with gossip. This is not the first time, and it won't be the last, that Aristophanes makes fun of Cleisthenes' effeminacy and sexual orientation. Either way, he tells the women that he has heard that there is a spy among them, a man disguised as a woman, sent by Euripides. Long story short, the women all check each other as the suspicion on Menesilicus rises to an eruption. Cleisthenes yanks off his brazier, and he is discovered for what he truly is. The following joke ensues. Stand up straight, aha, uh -huh, stuffing your cock out of sight? Gee, it's here, sticking out behind, such a healthy collar, too, sweetheart. Now where is it? Gone back in front. I don't see it. No, it's gone behind again. Man, you've got a better shuttle service for your prick than the Isthmus of Corinth has for its ships. Yes, what a scumpot the man is. No wonder he defended Euripides. Cleisthenes tells the women to keep him prisoner as he goes to fetch some guards. After the chorus sings, Nasilicus snatches Micah's baby and runs to the altar-seeking sanctuary. He threatens to kill the baby with a razor, but it turns out the baby was in reality a drinking wineskin. The joke is that although alcohol was not allowed at the festival, it was nonetheless common practice for women to sneak drinks disguised as babies. They continue to argue until the chorus makes an argument that I imagine is meant to be interpreted by the audience as a victorious defense of women. The women sees the pretender, and he, for some reason, figures that the only way he can call upon Euripides' aid is by acting out a role from his plays. First, he starts by pretending to be Helen from the Iliad. 
You must know that Euripides wrote a partly lost tetralogy wherein Helen is not actually abducted by Paris, rather the whole war is a mistake. All along the beauty was living in Egypt. Needless to mention, Euripides would write tragicomedies. Very entertaining mixtures. Euripides comes in, first pretending to be a mariner that recognizes Helen and wishes to help her or free her, and later pretending he is Menelaus and Helen calls to him. Comically, she calls him to visit her cunt. It is a sentence from Euripides that Aristophanes has modified. The women guarding Nasilicus do not recognize him as Euripides, they merely do not let him take the prisoner away. Later on, Euripides returns dressed as Perseus and thus Nasilicus plays the role of Andromeda in distress. This is not only the mythological story, but also a lost play of Euripides. Given as Andromeda was captive in a cave, and apparently there was a creature named Echo, somehow a crazy person shows up acting the role of Echo. Meaning, this one repeats every last thing anyone says. Echo annoys the guard. Euripides says that he is carrying Gorgon's head which the guard interprets as Gorgias' head, the sophist or philosopher. The guard raises Nasilicus' dress and pointing at his genital says, Take a peek at that vagina. It ain't exactly little. Euripides says, For whom the best of ruses is not enough I must think of something foolproof for a fool. This is an aphoristic boulder. The playwright comes back with a young attractive dancing girl. He tells the women that if they let him rescue his friend, he will no longer say anything bad about their gender again, and if not, he will make worst accusations and depictions. The women agree to this compromise. He then has the dancing girl seduce the guard. This erotic seduction is acted out, fulfilling Aristophanes' requirement that his plays must end with sex. Euripides releases Nasilicus and the play ends with everyone happy. Now, to encourage you to watch the final analysis and compilation of this series, I gift you an aphorism that I crafted as I read this play. The art of speaking consists of mastering the use of brief verbosity. If you enjoy or gain from my aphorisms, know that I have thousands. I will be writing books with short thematic essays composed out of aphorisms. These essays are profound and intriguing yet easy to read. For very cheap copies, look up Protagoras Pause in the Amazon website. I repeat, Protagoras Pause, that's my name.